Welcome to Lecture 18 of BIB 201, Bible Doctrines 1. Today's lecture is going to be finishing up the section on the names of God and then starting a new section on the nature of God. So let's get started. Picking back up where we left off in the last lecture, we are on the Old Testament names of God. Underneath the section of Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, we've been going through several different names of God that combine an attribute of God with his name Yahweh. Now we're on letter F. Yahweh Roi. This means the Lord, my shepherd. This obviously appears in one of the most popular psalms, Psalm 23, where the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This portrays the Lord as a shepherd who cares for his people, as a shepherd cares for the sheep of his pasture. Interpretively, this also means the Lord who sees me. Then, letter G, Yahweh Tsuknu means the Lord, our righteousness. This portrays the Lord as the means of our attaining a right standing to God. And then, letter H, Yahweh Shama, the Lord is there. This name of God portrays the Lord's personal presence in the Millennial Kingdom according to the context of Ezekiel 48. And then, lastly, letter I, Yahweh Elohim Israel, the Lord, the God of Israel. This identifies Yahweh as the God of Israel in contrast to the false gods of the other nations. And then the third and final name we find of God in the Old Testament is Adonai. Adonai means master, owner, or ruler. And this one actually appears in the plural form very much like Elohim and still used in the same way to show a compound unity of God. Now that we've discussed the Old Testament names of God and their meanings, let's move on to the New Testament names and their meanings. The first and most common is Theos. Theos means God, which is the equivalent to Elohim. Letter A. We find out as God being Theos, he is the only true God. Not only is he only true God as, as opposed to all the false gods that are out there, but letter B, he is unique. And obviously, his uniqueness comes in the fact that he is the one and only. And then letter C, he is transcendent. He is transcendent. He is so far above us and above all of the universe. And then letter D, lastly, he is the Savior. This name, Theos, is used of Jesus as God in John 1, John 20, 1 John 5, Titus 2, Romans 9, Hebrews 1, and 2 Peter 1, just to name a few places. But not only is Theos used as a name of God in the New Testament, so is Kyrios. Kyrios means Lord, which this is the equivalent to Adonai or Yahweh, more directly Adonai. Generically, Kyrios can mean Sir or Owner or Master or even refers to false idols and husbands. But it is used mostly as the equivalent of the Adonai of the Old Testament. It, too, is used of Jesus Christ, meaning, number one, he is a rabbi or sir. Number two, he is God or he is deity in several passages of the New Testament. And then number three, despotes. A despotes means master, and this is used several times in the New Testament to refer to God as our master. He is a master the owner, ruler, supreme authority of all. And then, fourthly and lastly, pater. Pater is God is our Father. Now, there is no Old Testament equivalent to this because this is a very New Testament teaching. This is something introduced to us by Jesus himself that we could see God as our Father. In fact, even referencing this in the way Jesus did in his time caused people, the Pharisees specifically, to want to kill him for it. 
Well, now that we have discussed the names of God, let's move on to the nature of God. The first thing I'd like to point out about the nature of God is that God is unified. The divine nature of God is undivided and indivisible. There is but one infinite and perfect spirit. God is not merely one. He is the only one. There cannot be more than one all-inclusive, more than one ultimate, more than one God. So let's look at a few aspects of God being unified. Number one, there are only three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, against polytheism, many gods, tritheism, three gods, or dualism, we urge the thought that two or more gods is self-contradictory, since each limits the other and destroys his godhead. The heathen have many gods, but they have no one god that completely satisfies. And then number two, the unity of God is an emphasis in the Old Testament. The Trinity or Triunity is not expressly taught in the Old Testament, but the unity is. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, we find that he is one Lord. In Isaiah 44 verse 6, it says there is no God beside him. And in Isaiah 45 verse 5, there is no God beside Jehovah. And then finally, for today's lecture, number three, the unity of God is confirmed in the New Testament. In John 17, verse 3, we find out that he is the only true God. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4, it says that there is no God but one. 1 Timothy 1, 17, he is the only God. In 1 Timothy 6, 15, he is the blessed and only God. And then lastly, in Ephesians 4, verses 5 and 6, he is one God. The unity of God, emphasized in the Old Testament, confirmed in the New Testament. Test number four will be in the next class that we have on campus. It will cover the topics from the arguments for the existence of God on page 29, which is basically the beginning of theology proper, through the names of God on page 35. Test number four will not include the section we did in this lecture on the nature of God. The nature of God will be included on test five. That brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.